Instead of running a test one, Thank you. 
Sayers yeah. has changed. It seems like China's just done more so now like, I'm still on GS. Yeah, I guess they're moving on. Yeah, but it's just like a lot of slack in that moment for sure. So they're reading back to the pack demo now, but I'm going to stay on GS. On the GS until I get a little If you're a hard worker, it's better for you, but if you're yeah, a hard yeah, yeah, worker, yeah. uh, because it's not guaranteed, it's based on the performance. Yeah. So, some people like it. Yeah. It's, it's the hard workers like it. Yeah. Um, well, it's yeah. Yeah. But the benefit is that Thank you. 
Yeah, no, I've been here every time, but I'm afraid because I have to be gone all next week. So I'm going to have to rely on those videos. But. Uh, I will be driving to Las Vegas. No, not for the reason you think. <laughs> no, it's because uh, <laughs> um, the, if I told you about the mobile app that I made, we're going to a convention in Las Vegas all next week to have a food. No, not next week. Um, because we're going to be there showing off the app. Yeah, the entire like that. Yeah. I haven't read through it yet. <laughs> I I understand that though. I think. Oh, I think so. Yeah, you have the bachelor's. That's uh, really they, there are a lot of camps, um, where people like you just pay like so much per month, and then there's like a group of people that will drive like a day. Hey, yeah, I thought it. Yeah. Uh, I was eating a basic cream in the morning, then uh, I went to lunch, and then for some reason my brain saw it's Wednesday. But I didn't realize I had to teach today, and the TA is, and they didn't call me until like what, 30 minutes after the talk had started. Uh, but it's my fault. Uh, I do apologize. Sorry, sorry for this. <laughs> next time, when uh, when this happens, uh, of course, uh, hopefully it won't be next time. Like you guys will call me already. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. So this is lab three. You are required to implement uh, a join aggregate, the insertion deletion, and uh, page. I will update this part. You have already done that for B plus three. Then you are able to at the end of the lab three, you are able to do this what we call the query workthrough. Of course, uh, one thing I didn't ask you to implement lab three that I will give you the source code for is the parser, meaning from SQL. Uh, input pass that into a uh, representation in relation to algebra at the query plan. So that's given to you. Okay? And once you implement all those modules, you are able to execute query like this. Okay? And then I will give you a kind of like a little challenge where I give you a small database, 
uh, it's a publication database called DBLP, and I will ask you to run your implementation against that database, and against three or four queries I have set up, and then you will document you you give me file the time your implementation has taken for executing those queries. Then we will try to find uh, which implementation has the best execution time. In other words, most efficient implementation. Okay? And I will try to figure out some small price for the team uh, that, that has the best execution time. Okay? All right, so that's kind of like what we do for that query. So there is a little contention going on there. Yes? There, is there grading on that? Or? Well, that's what I'm still deciding, what the price, whether the price is tied with bonus point or something like that. As a student, when I was a student, I always hate the idea of having bonus points. Because that basically means, you know, I don't have to do it, but the, having the thought that somebody else is doing it and get some actual point make me unease uh, at night. And uh, I, I really hate the idea. So typically, I don't get bonus points per se. So I will try to if, we're, if we have a really slow implementation, are we going to No, you are not going to be penalized by having a slow implementation. Okay. You will be penalized if you have an incorrect implementation. But as long as your implementation is correct, then no matter how long it takes you to finish your scores, uh, you are still given the full credit. Okay. Right? What I'm trying to figure out is how to award uh, the winning team that has most efficient implementation. I'm thinking of a small gift card or something. A dollar, uh, like a tie with dollar rather than a tie with your um, points. Okay? I think that might work out better. Okay? So like a, I'm gonna give part, I'm saying. And that's what I'm thinking uh, right now. So uh, so that's what lab three is about. I will give you about two and a half weeks for lab three uh, to implement. But with that being said, we should first finish the discussion on pre evaluator. Unfortunately because my V6 that I hard at me, I really sorry for that. Uh, I don't know whether we will have time to finish this discussion today, but I hope we will. Let's see. So we talked about query uh, execution. Last time we talked about uh, the basics of query evaluation on SQL tables. Now let's talk about uh, where we stop. We stop right here. Simple selection. And we talk about selectivity and reduction factor. And then we stop right here of using how to use index for selection. And I talk about you can convert. Uh, input query into something called conjunctive normal form, and the idea is whatever query condition you have, let's call that a, a predicate. Query uh, predicate. Uh, we first convert this to uh, conjunctive normal form. In other words, uh, this. And so on and so forth. Uh, in each term, is essentially some other term or together, right? And to simplify the discussion further, we ignore all these potential or operators, and each term is a single Boolean expression, and they are n together. That's essentially uh, the setup we have, right? So that's where we stopped last lecture. And in order to test, suppose you have an index either a tree index or a hash index and have four buckets. So no matter which index you have, uh, the first thing you need to decide is given a particular query term, a predicate like this, can you utilize the index to speed up your query processing or not? Can you actually use the index for it? And this introduces this concept called match. So give you an example, right? 
assuming I have an index, a B tree index, on A, B, and C. So that's my search key. My search key is a composite attribute containing A, B, and C. So for example, first name, middle name, and last name. So that's my search key. In other words, data entries in this index are sorted with respect to the value of first name. If there's a tie on first name, I break the tie by uh, middle name. If, there, if then there's a tie on the middle name, I break that using the last, value, the last name value. So that's my index now. So the definition of matching is the following. So for example, if you have an index on ABC, then I will claim it matches this condition of A equal to 5 and B equal to 3, but it does not match with the search condition of B equal to 3. If you look at this, what that, what that tells you is if, okay, if your query condition, conducting normal form, the attributes involved in your conducting normal form is a prefix it's a prefix of your search key uh, then we claim this index match your query credit in other words you can actually use the index to speed up this particular query processing in this example when b equal to 5 when b equals 3, when you query the condition, it's simply b equals 3. It is not a prefix of ABC. What's the prefix of ABC, by the way? It's either A or AB or ABC. These are the prefix for this index, for the search key of that index. And none of this match with your uh, query condition b equals 3, so we claim this index is useless for this particular query. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Why? Because if your index is built on A, B, and C, that means the data entries are sorted with respect to this first, then this, then this. A and B, then C, right? So a query condition on B is not going to be able to utilize this index because they are sorted by A first and then B. So having this index is not very useful to answer this query B equal to 3 at all, actually. However, if your condition is a prefix of your search key, such as a equal to 5 and b equal to 3, now you can use this index. Why? Because a and b form the prefix of your search key of the index. In other words, you know it's sorted by a, then b. So you can always use this condition first, and then further pruning the results using this condition. Uh, because it's a prefix of the search key. Okay? So that's for tree based index structure. By the way, for conjuncting normal form, you can uh, re rearrange the query terms to figure out whether there is a prefix matching against your search key or not. In other words, if I have a query condition that's like this b equal to 3 and a equal to 5. At first look, you saw, you know, this is not a prefix, right? It's B and A. This is not a prefix of my index. I cannot use the index. Well, the trick is for conducting normal form, for any conducting normal form, the ordering of the terms does not matter. So you can rearrange the terms in any order as you like so that this is equivalent to So that this now become a prefix of your search key, so you can still use the index to speed up this particular process. So the point is, this pref prefix match idea, you have to use this uh, carefully, in the sense that once you convert your query prat predicate into a conducting normal form, you have to look for all possible orderings to rule out uh, the possibility of having a match against some prefix of your uh, search key in order to claim, you know, this index is not useful for my my query before you can claim that. Okay, for tree based index. What about for hash index? For hash index, even if you conduct a normal form, the attributes from your conducting normal form match a prefix from your search key, 
you may not still uh, use you may you may not still be able to use your hash index. The reason is if this is a hash index, if I change this to a hash index, and my query condition is stay the same, and this ABC now is not a tree index but rather a hash index. In other words, when I do hash x, x must involve a, b, and c, right? Can you use this index to speed up this query processing? Even though it matches the prefix of your search key, it is still not very useful, right? Because uh, hash index doesn't support range query efficiently. The only way you can use this hash index to answer this is to Where you basically iterate through all possible values for the attribute C. Suppose C is a discrete domain with m distinct values. You have to check all m formulations in order to be sure you have answered this query properly using the hash index. If the domain value for C is a small size, is a small size, then this approach is fine. Right? This approach is fine. Suppose you know C is department. I only have five departments. Then I basically convert this query into five uh, queries. Uh, I can still do that fairly efficiently. However, if M is a fairly large value, then this approach will be really expensive because you have to iterate through all possible combinations uh, uh, against all possible C values, and that will be super expensive. Okay. So that's how you decide whether to use index or not. Now, there, once you decide, okay, an index is useful or not, there are still two approaches to answer general elections, general selections. The first approach is to find the most selective access path, <coughs> and retrieve the matching tuple using it, and then apply remaining terms that do not match the index. I'll give you a simple example. Right? Suppose I have the following query. I have A a simple, very simple example. I, I have two indexes. One is a B tree index that's on A and B. I also have a hash index. For the same, of course, this is my data file. Right. So both index are on top of uh, this same data file for your table. Okay? Now, using the discussion we just had, using the discussion we just had, okay? using the discussion we just had, the argument is. Now suppose I make this a little bit more interesting. I make this a hash on A and C. Okay? A and C. So first of all, this term is a prefix of my B tree index. So I can use B tree to answer this part. But the observation is using B tree can only answer this part. It doesn't give you any uh, filtering on the attribute C. Okay? That makes sense? So this is what we call access path one, which is simply use A and B to access this B tree and find all matching records. Then, of course, you need to do a post processing step. For all returning tuples, you check their C value and filter out those who do not equal to three, and you return the results. That's access number one, access path number one. What about access num uh, path number two? Well, the argument is, yes, I only have a hash index on A and C, so I cannot use this hash index to answer this query directly, but for the argument's sake, for the argument's sake, the size, suppose B is a small domain. B is a small domain. Let's say B can only take value two values, six or seven. 
what I'm going to say. Then I can change this query to So in order to use this index, in order to use this index, right? In order to use this index, what I do, I will answer this query. I will answer the following two queries. One is a to five, b to seven, and c to three. And two two is so I, I simply use this as my input condition to this query. Then I will check against uh, for all the retaining tuples, I check the value of b. Because the domain of b is small, hopefully this post-processing filtering step is not too expensive. Do you follow me, the argument? So this is what I call access class 2. Now here comes the question. Which one would you choose? Which one would you choose to answer in order to answer this query? Which one would you choose to answer this query? <coughs> well, it really depends on this discussion we had earlier, which is the uh, the selectivity. The selectivity. Right? You have to look at the selectivity for these two access paths to figure out which one is more efficient. What do I mean by that? Okay. If you think about both access paths. One thing in common is that they are both a relaxation of the original query. In other words, if you use access path one or access path two, what you get is a superset. You always get a superset of your final answer. Set of tuples in your final answer, right? Which one is more efficient? And both and, and the other common thing about the two approach is that the second step is the same operation, which is do a linear scan over every record in the returning set and filter out the tuples who do not satisfy that additional equality condition. And the first one is you check C, and the second one you check the condition on D. But other than that, they are identical. You do a linear scan, you figure out whether the returning tuples match the third condition or not, which is the equality condition on either C or B. That being said, which one is more efficient really depends on one thing, which is the superset you return in step one, which has a smaller size. Do you follow me? Which has a smaller size? Of course, there's the, there is still some subtle uh, difference between the two. One is the B tree, one is the hash index. In other words, this equality search might be a little bit more efficient than this equality search using B tree. However, if we make an argument that this is a class index and the first few levels are cached in mid memory, literally there are almost no difference in terms of the I.O. cost for retrieving one matching record for equality search. Right? The difference between B tree and the hash is, is really small in that case. So it boils down to one thing, which is which superset that you return in step one is more selective? Which, whichever one that's more selective, you should go with that. Do you follow the argument? That's essentially what is the approach proposed here. You always select the most selective access path. That's the reason why. You follow this argument now? You choose the most selective access path. Linear scan 
and checking one equality condition on one attribute, either B or C, it doesn't matter. But you're doing a linear scan over all attributes from here or here. So it boils down to which and this part for a single tuple, for a single tuple, this cost is the same. So at the end of the day, which is more efficient boils down to uh, uh, the size of the two supersets. Which one? The one, the smaller one always gives you uh, less per cost. Yes. S would fill up a whole intersection. Well, that's a good question. So let me throw out that as a question, right? The, the question is, is this the case or as what you suggested, this is this. Huh? So which is the case? This or this? First of all, one thing that's clear. This is only a special case of this. You follow me? Yeah. So this, then the question is, essentially the question is, is it always that this is true? And using, you know, it's a little bit hard to think about this problem, but using this particular example, let me materialize this using this particular example. S1 is what? S1 is A equal to 5, B equal to 7. Is that right? Yeah? What about S2? C equal to 3. Now what is S? No matter whether this this is the case or this is the case, S is the same. S is right? So can someone tell me which is the case? You be the one that's right. Yes, why? Uh, you're going with the case on the left uh, here at S. <coughs> Has the C equals three, but that same case doesn't exist on the other side. Which so you're accounting for all values of C and S one, right? Uh huh. <laughs> well, the trick, the answer is right. right? This this must be the case. But the rationale you provide, I I don't quite hundred percent follow what you said. The, the, the trick is you may not only have A, B, and C, you may have some additional attribute like D or E. Right? Then this must be the case, right? Because you, you have other freedoms rather than A, B, and C. Potentially. You have other freedoms other than these three dimensions. Your relation is not necessarily just A, B, and C, it could be D and E, right? You may have other dimensions of freedom as well. That's the reason why this is in the general case. Of course, uh, it's always possible that this is the case, that it's just a special case of this. When, when that happens is that the other dimensions do not have freedom at all. Then you end up with this. But this, this is a good, uh, uh, good example. So I have an example of this idea. So I will skip this example, but basically they follow exactly what I have just discussed. The key observation is, the cost of retrieving one tuple to this part and this part is the same, and the cost of filtering out one tuple from here to here is the same. So it boils down to essentially the size of the two sets. Which one is bigger, which one is smaller? The smaller one always gives you a lower cost. So that's the first approach. What is the second approach? The second approach is the following argument. In modern computers, we don't have just a single processor. Sometimes, even if we we only have one single processor, we have multiple cores of the same processor. Right? In the first approach we have just discussed, the idea is you select the most selected path, you execute the query against that, but the remaining terms in your CNN app, while you're executing a query against the most selected path, the remaining terms from your CNN app are not used at all. They are only used in the second post-processing step. Why don't we do it in parallel? In other words, if that's the case, or then the 
choice is clear. What we said so far makes sense. You think select the most selected part, either this or this. What if, what if, what if that's the case? Well, seemingly you are making just a random choice. Because I cannot tell which one is more selective, I just randomly go with one. And then the other one is not used at all until you... Then it becomes really a sequential algorithm, right? You do this, then you do this. Another idea would be exactly what, have, what we have shown here, which is... You do this in parallel, then you do an intersection of them. You do them in parallel, then you do an intersection in the end. Does it make sense? When the two access two or more, it, it necess, it's not necessarily only two access paths, right? You could have multiple access paths, right? Uh, for, for example, another access path here will be just you can always do this, right? That's another access path. Heap file scan. That's always possible to you. You can ignore all the indexes you have, just do a heap file scan, right? So the the second approach will be to if when you do not have one access path that's way more selective than the rest, and you don't know which one to use, maybe a good idea is to do it in parallel, then do an intersection. And when you do that, though, the difference is, in the first approach, when you uh, use one access path, the most selective access path, select the set, then you do a post-processing step, this set contains actual tuples or records. You do need those records or tuples rather than just the data entries. Why? Because you need to do that post-processing step. Having only data entries is not good enough. For example, if you only use data entry, this will be only A and B, this will be only A and C, there's no way you can do the additional filtering using C or B in both cases. So you will have to retrieve the actual records <coughs> rather than just retrieve the data entries. That's essentially the requirement of the first approach. However, if you do it in the second approach, you do it in parallel, then you do intersection, the same tricks, the same approach still works, meaning you, you retrieve the actual records, then you do the intersection of the records. So this is fairly expensive. Record could be much bigger in size than the data tree. So one optimization you can do here is you retrieve only the record IDs. You don't even have to retrieve the data entries. You only retrieve the record IDs. It's even smaller than the data entries. Your data entry has record IDs and the search key value. You no longer need the search key value. You just need the record IDs. Then you do an intersection of the record IDs. Those are the potential set of candidates for your final answer. Retrieve them, check them. Uh, then you use one of the access paths to retrieve uh, those matching record IDs, and then you, uh, you do the final field frame using uh, the remaining terms. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Okay. So in the, second, in the first approach, remember, in the first approach, you need to retrieve the tuples. In the second approach, you only need to retrieve the record IDs through intersection, then using the intersected record IDs to retrieve the final record. Okay? So that's a slight uh, difference of the two. Now, uh, for protection, for protection query, this is actually fairly straightforward if you do not have the distinct keyword. When you do have the distinct keyword, this becomes a little bit tricky because if you do supply the distinct keyword, then you have to do a duplicate elimination. And to do duplicate elimination, you basically have two approaches, like we discussed in last lecture. One is sorting, the other is to do hashing. Right? You can do either sort or hashing. So I'll give you a simple example. Suppose I want to do this uh, select this thing of RID, uh, SID and BID from reserve. So this may have duplicates, right? Because the same sailor may return the same boat on different dates. If you look at uh, the sample schema we're using here, uh, the combination of all three attributes is the primary key. In other words, 
the same theta may reserve the same both on different dates. So if you only select the per, uh, if you only choose to put out the sale ID and the boat ID, you may potentially have a duplicate that you need to remove, duplicate on the date ID. So how do we do this? Well, you here is a basic approach using sorting. What you do is you scan the relation R and you extract only the needed attributes. In other words, you get rid of the date attribute. Why you want to do this? Well, this will be a useful step. You pay only linear cost, but you reduce the size of each record. In other words, effectively you are increasing the value of B, the number of objects that can fit into a page. Because the object size is smaller now. Your page size is fixed, but the object size is smaller, so B, as a, as a result, the value of B becomes larger after you have done this step. And that's impact a lot of things because for sorting, you know, uh, it really depends on these two values. When you have a larger value of B, uh, these values goes goes down. So you are basically you can only look at this. When you have a larger value of B, this goes down, meaning you have less number of pages to sort. So obviously that's an improvement to your sorting components. Now Before the resulting set, you remove a, a, a nearby or consecutive duplicate. You do a linear scan of that. So suppose reserve with a size ratio of uh, 0 0.25 of 250 pages. So the argument is after you have done this step, assuming I gave this to you, of course in practice you have to look at the schema information to figure out what's the reduction in size of each record after you have done the scanning and removing unnecessary attributes step, right? Suppose in this case I tell you after that uh, each record becomes only 25% uh, of the original size you may, you may wonder why that's the case well typically the, the date value is much larger in size than both CID and both ID so even though it's only one third of your attribute it may take up 75% of your space for a given record. Okay, so yeah. uh, do you do the same before the access option? <coughs> Do you do the distinct before the? Uh, you mean if you have a selection? Yeah, like so. Do you do? Uh, okay. Do you get the bigger set and do the distinct on that, then choose which uh, access path one or two, or do you? So there, there, there are two things you are asking, right? First of all, when you say uh, you may have multiple access paths, and typically that refers to when you have a selection condition. Here, look at this query. It doesn't have any selection condition. It's just a, a simple projection. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about the access pass yet because there is no selection condition. But if you do have a selection condition, typically you do the selection <coughs> first and then you do the projection. Does that make sense? So, so that's the typical approach. So in this case, we suppose we have a 25% reduction rate in size. So let me show you the analysis of the cost back here. So what you do is the following. You you argue, okay, I have to do a linear scan of all my records and using the, the numbers I give you here so reserve, let me copy that so that we don't have to go back and forth reserve we have a table size 40 bytes and we have 100 tuples page and we have <coughs> one thousand pages. Okay? Now that being said, let's look at how we derive this formula right here. We do a linear scan of PFAL scan over the uh, reserve table reserve table and we write out the new record, quote unquote new record, when we strip away the date attribute. So the new record only contains seal ID and the vote ID. And the reduction rate is given to you, which is 25%. In other words, you pay 1,000 IOs, and in the output, it becomes only 250 IOs of write. Of write. Uh, you have to write this many pages to the disk. 
then you need to sort you need to sort them. And if I tell you the buffer size is 20, if I tell you buffer size is 20, what happens? What happens is you can sort this in roughly uh, two paths. Why? So in path one, I get Right? This is a value that's less than, obviously less than 20. Or less than 19, actually. In other words, I can, these are how many rounds you have. And even if I don't use that tournament sort to improve, to do the, uh, to reduce the number of rounds, if I use that, it becomes more important. If I use the tournament sort, I further reduce the number of rounds to this value. And I only need to check if this number of rounds can be merged in one more pass, which obviously, if this condition is true, that means you can merge this number of rounds in one more pass. <coughs> That's how I get the conclusion that I only need two paths to sort uh, 250 pages using a buffer size of 20 pages. Do you follow me? Yeah? Okay. So that's the cost. And finally, I need to do another linear scan. Why I need to do this? How to remove the consecutive duplicates. You need another linear pass, right? But you still need to do a linear pass to remove duplicates. So that's the final cost of that. Yeah. So why is there two times two? Uh, because you need two paths. And each pass you read and write, that's essentially the external merge pass. Right. <coughs> so there is a slight improvement. So here is what I'm going to discuss with you next, which is sometimes, not always, but sometimes you can actually uh, do this improvement, which is if you look at this, if you look at this, what I will do is instead of reading the pages and removing attributes and them back to this, I can do this on the fly. I can do this on the fly. Remember what we do in the first phase of external merge sort. What do we do? We load the pages, we sort them, and we dump to this. Right? So the idea is why not? I have 20 pages here, right? In the middle line, right? What I can do is I can load 80 pages from my disk and squeeze them into 20 pages because the reduction rate is 25%. Meaning I, I load a page by page, I load one page, but then it becomes only one quarter of, of a page because I remove the date attribute. I can keep doing that until I Load 80 pages, they will fully occupy my 20 pages box. You follow me? That's essentially what I will do. So I'm combining this phase with the first phase of my sorting step. Rather than doing it separately, I combine them together. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first improvement I will do. That's the first improvement I will do, which is 1,000 plus 250. But, but the point is, at this point, my output are sorted. My output are sorted already. And how many sorted rounds I have by this step, up to this step? Well, if I use the tournament sort, if I use tournament sort as the improvement, I got this many rounds. Um, of course, this is on um, expectation. On average, you get this many rounds, and the size of each round is roughly uh, 40 pages. On expectation, on expectation. Right? Or if you don't use this uh, tournament sort, you get this many rounds, and each is 20 pages. Right? Except the last one. So that's the difference between this and this, right? Here. 
it's not sorted, it's just removing them, but it's not. Now, the other improvement, which is, okay, so now I have, using this, I already done one pass, right? I do need another pass. I still need one pass to read it and write it, to do the merging, and then do another linear scan to remove duplicates. Seems like there's nothing you can do over there. However, one observation, here is another improvement I want to introduce to you, which is the following. The observation is the following. Okay. So let's calculate this value. 250 divided by 20, what's, uh, what's the value of that? It's 10. So it's about 12, right? 13. That's roughly 13. Alright? We got 12, give me 240, 13 must be enough. Okay? So it's 12 something. Even if I don't use the tournament sort, if I use tournament sort, this value becomes only 7. Take the signal of that, 6 point something, that's a 7. So I don't even need to use tournament sort. I, I only have 13 rounds. So that's critical, because when you only have 13 rounds, and you can merge how many rounds, by the way? You can merge. Converge 19 rounds, and you only have 13 rounds in total. You follow me? Which means, at any given time, each round has a representation in your memory buffer. You don't even use the remaining six. What's the catch here? What's the observation here? You can actually do the sorting and duplicate elimination at the same time. You follow me? You can do the sorting and duplicate elimination at the same time, rather than do the sort then read them again to eliminate, eliminate duplicates. Why? If the cursor happens to point to the same values, in this case, both values will be pushed to the output, then you load them back in to eliminate them. Eliminate all of them except the first one. Whereas you can modify your accidental sorting algorithm a little bit. When the cursors point to the same value, you push only one of them to the output buffer. The remaining one, you simply skip them. However, what's the catch? The catch is you can only do this if you can merge all the rounds at the same time. If there are some additional rounds, <coughs> for example, there's a 14th round, even though you are able to merge 14 uh, rounds, but you don't look at it, you, let's say you only merge 13 rounds out of 14 rounds, this is incorrect because the last round is it doesn't participate in the merging and escaping process, you are still producing duplicates as a result. Do you follow my argument? So the requirement is what? The requirement is, in order for you to do this optimization, what's the requirement? The requirement is, the number of rounds you have must less than or equal to the number of rounds you can merge. When you have this condition, you can safely go ahead combining the sorting and duplicate elimination step together. Translate to a mass formula, when I says this, this is essentially the number of rounds, if you are not using two number sort as an improvement, right? Must less equal than the number of rounds you can merge. If I ignore the constant and ignore the settings, I take out B. <coughs> so this is essentially the requirement. Do all of you follow my reasoning so far? This is the number of pages. This is uh, this is the number of rounds you can produce. And if you use two limit sort, this is the number of rounds, but if I ignore the constant, uh, that's essentially what I get. 
In other words, m must be equal to the square root of the number b. But this is a similar condition as what? As the condition of finishing hybrid hash in just two phase. If this doesn't hold, the hybrid hashing you need to recursively apply that on the larger partitions to make sure until every partition fits in your memory size. And the same condition actually surface again. Okay. So now, suppose this condition holds, then you will get this formula right here. Why? You do the 1000 uh, IO to read and 250 to dump to disk, but by this time they are sorely wrong already. Then you just need to load them back in. You do the merging and you can elimination at the same time. You're done. You don't need to pay any additional IOs. Of course, there is an additional IO, which is uh, the IO to write the output, but we, as I argue many, many times, but now we typically don't count that. Even in this approach, we didn't count the IO for writing the output, right? So, so that's kind of an optimization you can do. That explains this value right here. Anyone having questions so far? Okay, do you pay elimination uh, uh, using hashing? Well, the idea is, you know, we talk about <coughs> using uh, hashing for Gruba, right? Gruba, of course, Gruba aggregate. And we basically present two algorithms to you. One is uh, what we call the hybrid hashing. The other one is what we call the, uh, 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 sorry, the first one is called two-phase hashing. The second one is called hybrid hashing. The idea of hybrid hashing is to push that rehash phase into the first step rather than putting them separately. Right? So that's the idea. So for you to do the uh, distinct elimination, if we assume partition phase in memory, in other words, number of buffer pages is greater or equal to the square root of number of pages of the protected tuple, which is essentially uh, this condition right here. So what do we do? We read 1,000 pages, and we write output partitions of protected tuples. That's 250 pages. And then we simply load them in to do the rehash phase. That's just another 250 pages. So overall, the cost is, right? This is a hashing phase. Then you just read all part. You read all partition once, but at the end of the day, you're reading 250 pages. Uh, this is the read hash phase. And when this condition holds, when this condition holds, and assuming your hash distribution is balanced. Uh, you guarantee that each partition actually will fit in your buffer page, so you're done. You don't need to worry about doing this recursive thing for those partitions that's larger than the memory size, because that will not happen when this condition is true. Okay? So this is what if you're using the two-phase hashing. What about if you're using hybrid hashing? What's the IO cost? If you're using hybrid hashing, what happens? Well, if you're using hybrid hashing, you're you're saving from both here and here. But the question is how much saving you have. Why I claim you have saving from here and here? Because there are potentially many partitions you don't even have to push to disk and load them back in. They are handled by the in-memory buffer while you're doing the partition effects. Those are the savings. The exact amount of saving you have, that's data dependent. It's hard to quantify using a formula, but essentially, the amount of saving is the number of partitions, and the number of pages in those partitions, that you don't have to push to disk and load them back in to do the rehash. Do you follow me? Yeah, so that's the saving if you're using hybrid hash. Okay, so there's some discussion on using index for duplicate elimination. This is very straightforward. If you understand my earlier discussion on using index for selection, so I will skip that. And I will use one minute to start the discussion on drones. Actually, I could have finished this today. Uh, in due to my stupid mistake, I wasn't able to. Uh, but I do like to have a discussion on this so that 
at least you have everything you know you need to know for implementing your lab stream. So I will just start with this. Join is expensive, right? So how do I execute join? So this, this is my basic setup. I have R and S. I have this many pages in R, this many pages in S, and I have those many tuples per page from R and S. And I want you to execute this simple natural join query. Or you call it a join condition, right? Natural join essentially is you call it a join condition. Okay. How do you do this? Well, the simplest approach is what we call a nested group join. What do you do? You load the first tuple in R, and for every tuple in R, you scan through every tuple in S. And then you check whether the, they match the join condition or not. What's the I.O. cost of this approach? What is the I.O. cost of this approach? N squared will have to be a little bit more uh, precise using the discussion we have, right? We have PR uh, is N actually at the end of the day, you scan through all the tuples in R, which is N1 number of tuples. And for each tuple in R, you loop through all tuples in S. And you do that tuple by tuple. So in, in terms of I.O., you are paying this many I.O.s. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you finish scanning R once. Right, you finish scanning R once. So you have to account for that as well. You have to account for that as well, which is as well. However, some optimization you can do is when you are scanning through tuples in S, Yes, you are doing tuple by tuple, but a simple optimization is you load page by page and buffer them. So the I.O. you do is essentially this, rather than M2. You follow me? And similarly, when I scan through tuple in R, instead of doing tuple by tuple, I do page by page, uh, I buffer them. I still do the checking tuple by tuple, but when I, when I do the loading, when I do the I.O., I do page by page. So that's essentially and to be precise, this is essentially how many tuples you have is essentially this, but since n1 denotes the number of tuples, you know this just equal to n1. Okay? With that being said, that's a simple nested loop join. Uh, I mean, this is obviously very expensive. Next lecture, we will talk about how to optimize this further. Okay? Thank you.